Welcome to River Foursquare, where we connect with one another in communities, both in person and online. You can find more about that at riverfoursquare.org by clicking on the Connect tab. We have a special fun event if you're in the Seattle area coming up for August. Is it a tradition? It's a tra Well, I guess it could be. It's could now be it's, it's third year. This is our third year. It is our annual, I guess I can say that, annual, annual barbecue potluck with smoked meat. Uh, cooked by none other than Pastor Andrew, and a fun movie night in our backyard. It'll be August 19th at 6 p.m. Festivities will start. We'll start the movie probably as soon as it gets dark enough to do that, and we'll have some activities and food and things going on before. If you'd like to come to that, you can RSVP to us. Again, riverforcecore.org. Uh, click on All Community Gathering, and you'll see all the information you need to join us for that event. And finally, if you're part of River, thank you so much for continuing to give of your finances to support what God is doing here. You can do that at riverforsquare.org, or you can click on the Give tab at riverforsquare.org, or you can text to 84321. Jesus, you're here. You're here with us. You're here as we gather. Your, your spirit is with us. Holy Spirit, be the one who teaches us. Leads us lead us to truth today. Show us what we need to see. Change what needs to be changed. Transform what needs to be transformed. Renew what needs to be renewed. Father, we trust you as we get into your word, as we get into your scripture today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we spoke of Jesus went to the pool. Not the Janet Evans pool, but the pool of Bethsaida. Equally, she didn't swim there. It's not an Olympic-sized pool. And there was a man there <coughs> who had an infirmity where he couldn't walk. He was crippled. He was lame. We're not sure exactly, but he couldn't. Mobility was not a thing. And Jesus asked him a question. He goes, do you want to be healed? And so we see from the story that the, the main things we have to pull out of it is one of that God sees you. He sees what you're going through. He, he knows the things that nobody else knows, that you know, but nobody else knows. He sees that. And in that, his promises are still true for you, even though if you're going through stuff, his promises are still true, and he sees you. The other thing is when we're going through stuff and we're going through hardship or there's going through a hard time, God may ask questions of us. And he's not asking questions to be, to, to be anything other than he wants us, he wants to ask the questions so we can see his answers, to get out all that needs to be gotten out so that we can see his answer, so we can see what he's doing, to get out of our head what needs to be getting out of our head. And whether or not we received God's promise does not negate the power of his promise. His promise is still true, whether we've received it or not. If we haven't received it yet, it is yet still to come. It is yet to be fulfilled. His promise is still coming. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up, or other translations say, do not lose heart. So, question here is, how did you focus on God's promise this week? Did you focus on God's promise this week? What did God's promises look like in the course of the last seven days? What did that look like? Were they, were they on your mind? Was there one you were thinking on? Is there one you were meditating on? What did that all look like? Let's talk.
So Andrew picks random TV shows to watch while I work at night. And recently we've been watching I, uh, it's the official name of the show. I don't Seven, know. Mary, Three, and Four. I, I, that just, that just told everybody, everybody, everybody everything. Else, that's and it. dated us at the exact same time. There you go. And it's about police officers. I know that much. In the 70s. You could be Seven, Mary, Three. I, I don't know if be. I could be Seven, Mary, Four, though. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they are motorcycle police officers, and their job is to go out into the world and make and sure people are following bikes. the rules, right? And one of the guys is new, and he constantly gets in, into... Seven, Mary, Four. ...into scrapes and adventures. And their job, though, is to look for people <laughs> who are breaking the law and to help people who are in trouble, right? And so this last week, they uh, caught these flower thieves. I'm like, I don't even think that this was a thing, but apparently the flower thieves were going and removing flowers from the flower boxes that had just been planted by dressing in similar gear and garb and then just taking them away. I guess they would go sell them or use them somewhere else. I, I don't still know. It would be landscape. a hard sell, but yeah, what do I know? Exactly. Uh, and so they were bring charges. You know, we see that word bring charges would be filed against these criminals that they are taking care of. And so they would document the crime. They write out the tickets. They accuse the person that they've arrested of committing this crime. And then depending on what the case is, it'll go to court and all the things that will happen from there that we know happens on all the judge duty shows, right? And we see those things happen. And this week, Jesus, he's out doing what his father's business, right? He is out. We, we just talked about last week. He had healed the guy at the pool. He's hanging out near the temple area. And he is accused of disregarding the Jewish law. So this is really part two. Two yes, of, last of last week. week. So go and yep. listen to last week. So you get part one. This is yes. really part two because this is the rest of the story of what happened to the man in the pool. Yes. So he healed this man. He told him to carry his bed. And Jesus, being raised as a good Jewish young man, he knew that on the Sabbath day, you did not work. And carrying a bed was considered in this long list of rules, work. So the Jewish people were upset. And when they talked to him about that, they also... Jesus was telling people that God was his father. Big no-no, okay? So the Jewish leaders were angry. They wanted to kill Jesus, and they were bringing these charges against him. We're going to pick up in John chapter 5, 10 through 20. So the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, the guy by the pool, it is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But the man answered them, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who'd been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found this man in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father's working until now, and I am working. And this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So, you know, here we go. We talked about the Jewish people. You know, they see this guy carrying his bed. Oh, do, do, do. you're breaking the law. What are you doing? You know, first of all, get a life. Anyway, yeah, carry, carry right. Life. Like, hey, the police are out there can think they confronted him about breaking the sabbath he's like hey but i just got healed and the man that healed me told me to take my bed with me to go home i, I love right? how i love how the the man who just got healed blamed jesus right he he told me the scapegoat like I, I just i got healed and i was so surprised i picked up my bed forgot the law and just went out right the jews were mad they didn't celebrate the fact that this guy just got healed this guy who'd been crippled for 38 years they were not celebrating they were upset because he just was breaking the law it's a whole nother Not thing the guy there. who healed you, but right, the, guy the guy who told, who told you, to you to pick up your bed. bed. Yes. So man, so the man finds Jesus again. They're all hanging out in that area. And Jesus encouraged him to live a life without sin, to do things against God, that not to do things against God's way anymore, to do things the right way of living. And so the man, somehow he ran into the Jewish leaders again. He's like, oh, there's the guy. It's that Jesus guy. And the Jews, again, they get more angry. And Jesus starts talking with them. And he says that he's God's son. And he's only doing what the father tells him to do, right? 
And they, Jesus, Jewish leaders already knew it was probably Jesus they already anyway, knew it was Jesus. right? Who else is healing people? Right, exactly. So Jesus tells them again, I'm doing what the Father showed me to do, and this healing is only the beginning of what the Father and I have planned, right? And we're going to get more into more of what Jesus beginning of Jesus's really long speech. We're going to gets thick. It gets thick and heavy. We're going to be diving into that over the next few weeks. So stay tuned. But we're going to stop right there for a moment and ask a question. Why do you think Jesus had the man carry his bed if he knew it was the Sabbath? Because Jesus knew the law and the law says you shouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And he said, carry the bed. Yeah. Why I, do you think? Why do you think I was up? What was I he have up opinions, to there? But I can't give it. Correct. Yet. We're not giving those opinions. Discuss in your community. Why do you think Jesus had the man carry the bed? He knew clearly that it was against the law, but he did it anyway.
So obviously there's another turning point in the conflict between the Jewish leaders and Jesus. It's only going to get more complicated and more downhill from here. The Jews... They're Jewish, already plotting against him. They're already plotting against him. They were determined. They were starting the list of all the infractions that Jesus was doing. They were making charges. They were like the police officer on the bike that pulls up to your car, and you were speeding, your taillight's out, you have um, a, you know, expired, expired license, registration. your registration's expired, you didn't have your insurance card in the car. And, and you weren't wearing list, your seatbelt. And you weren't, like, all the things. Everything's getting longer and longer. The list is growing. And... According to the Jewish law, to claim equality with God was actually called, was considered blasphemy. And it was, the penalty for that was death. So they were not like, they were angry. They were like, how can you say this? This is serious. You should not be doing this. And on a side note, Jesus was also claiming to be equal with God. In yeah. him. So a lot of people say, well, Jesus never claimed divinity. No, he did. He Just did. read the Gospels. Yep. It's there. Yep. So he claims he's God's son, that he's equal with God. He does what the Father's doing. He's listening and following the Father's plans. And the God's plans had even bigger things to come than just one healing, just one thing that was being done there. And from a Western perspective, if you just read that, you just were so far removed. We're like, well, why does it matter if he's claiming there's God's son? When we hear people claim that there are all kinds of things all the time now in our world, and we're like, oh, whatever. But it was a big deal. It was, it was a penalty of death. So they were seeking that. That's why they wanted to kill him. And these accusations were being compiled. Jesus was in trouble physically because of it, but he just kept speaking the truth. And as I said, we're going to keep reading more about that in the next few weeks. And so Jesus knew who he was. That's why he had the confidence to speak back to them and not be afraid of all the penalties that they were, all the things they were racking up, right? He had God on his side. Because of that, he knew he, what he was going to do. He knew what God had planned, his father had planned, and that include the greater works of salvation, of Jesus taking our place on the cross and setting us free, right? He didn't run away in fear. He didn't give up. He spoke the truth. And in life, we can also find ourselves facing a variety of charges, right? So Jesus was charged with these things, and he just stood up to them, and he said, no, this is what God says, right? And depending on how we've lived our lives, maybe you've actually been actually charged by something legally. You've faced fines or community service or jail because of choices that you've made that have broken the natural laws of what we have in our country, right? Dealing with the consequences of our behaviors or facing false accusations. Someone had a grudge against us like the Jewish leaders had for Jesus. And they came against us with false charges and we have to find a way to dispute them. Right? We may have dealt with that like physical, actual, not, like real things. But most often, most human beings, the charges that we face when we become followers of Jesus are the lies and the accusations of the enemy and of ourselves and words from other people that go in our head. Charges that tell us that we're not enough, that we'll never amount to anything, that um, we don't look or act right to see the dream that we have, that God's put in our heart to come true, that we're a mess, we'll always be a mess, or insert your own. I'm sure if you've been around life any period of time, somebody has said something to you that may have, have stuck right? That, that thing in your head that just spins and spins when you go and want to do something and all you hear is, oh, nope, you can't do that because of this. It's, it's when that thing happens it's as if somebody presses play mm -hmm. on, the, on the streaming video and you get yeah. to rewatch that film again, even though that thing that just happened to me and had nothing to do with that previous yeah. account, all of a sudden that's the only audio you hear yeah. is that previous event and words mm -hmm. you're attempting to reach for that dream or that job that adventure or make a new friend and all you can hear in your head is that pre-recorded thing pressing play over and over again uh, they haunt our thoughts about who we are who we see ourselves to be and it's not in alignment with anything that god's word says sometimes they're the accusations of the enemy reminding us of all the ways that we've sinned and failed jesus right Oh, you've just done this and did this over and over again, and you've always are going to keep messing up, and you're never going to be free of this, right? Things that we did before we met Jesus, or but Satan wants to keep us stuck in them. You know, if people knew the real you, they would you would never be promoted or liked or anything. So you just have to keep hiding and not come out. It's 
we struggle with things or we're disqualified from serving Jesus or receiving the fullness of his love and his truth. And all of these charges are structured to keep us from living life freely and the way that God has for us to live. Imagine like if you, these people that get charged in the natural, right? They get put into a jail cell. There are bars and walls and locked doors and confinement. It's not huge, it's small, and you're stuck in there. You can't get yourself out, right? This is, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to build a case against us and to disqualify us from trying. If we're believing the lies, then we're not going to walk in the confidence that God has for us. We will second guess ourselves. We'll limit ourselves. We will avoid situations that could prove that these lies are actually true so that we don't do anything. We just sit around and do nothing because it would be too hard to try because it'll just prove that it's just right. This is just what happened. You know, we're locked up in that small space, watched and told what to do and when to do it. And our lives are controlled by these thoughts that we've allowed to take possession of our mind, right? We've allowed them to rule and reign and have control. And that is not what Jesus wants for us. And that's not the example that he showed us. He says that we are free and that we are able to do what God has called us to do because we are God's kids, right? So we're going to ask a question for our communities. So what types of charges, if we think about those lies that the enemy says or those, those thoughts or those things that just circulate in our head, do you face most often in your mind? Lies of the enemy accusing you of things and reminding you of things that you've done or words of man, things that people have spoken over you or you've allowed yourself to think about yourself because of different things that you've encountered in life. Which one of those tends to be your biggest battle? And what do you do to combat them, overcome them, defeat them? What is the way that you find a way out of that pressing play. How do you stop the thought? How do you stop it? How do you press stop on the tape recorder? Tape recorder? In your brain. You mean MP3 player? MP3 player. Digital format. I know, but it's so much better to think of a tape recorder. I don't know why. That's old because school. Because tape recorder. Seven Mary 3 and 4. Yeah. Well, you know, we're in that genre, right? Did they have tapes in there? Or were they doing eight tracks? It was the transition years. Transition years. There you go. So <laughs> what, <laughs> what are those thoughts? What are those charges? How do you combat them?
So as if you've been a part of River or any church or any part of Christianity, you will know that Jesus came to set people free. You've heard that before. There's all kinds of verses on that. Right? There are lots of Bible verses about that. It's the greatest work that he's talking about in that passage. He says, greater works these will I do. That is the greatest work. Is the healing, bigger than the healing of that crippled man, is he was going to take our place. He was going to set us free. Take a penalty for our sins. uh, That we would become the sons and daughters of God. And because of that, we can then introduce other people to Jesus. And it can be this ripple effect of transformation of excitement of worship and and partnering together to solve problems and see God's kingdom be established here in our own lives and in the lives of others and then in the world, right? And we can pray and we can see miracles of healing in our souls and our spirits and our physical bodies. And we can be free of all those charges that are being brought against us. In Revelations 12, 10, uh, it says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. See, Satan is out there accusing us over and over again, reminding us and trying to remind God of all the things that we've done wrong. And when we accept Jesus... We are set free from that. And his, he has been cast down. When Jesus took our place on the cross, when he went and he combat, had that battle, he set us free forever. And that voice has been silenced. The accuser has been thrown down. The accusations no longer are valid. Yep, there's no power. Because we've been declared not guilty. Yep. And Satan has been defeated. And John eight thirty six. You know, we're going to get to that verse eventually, but we're going to say it over and over again over the next few weeks. Is the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed, right? You are free. There is no more trapped. There is no more locked. The doors are open, and it's our choice to walk through them to be free. Jesus told the Jewish leaders who he was. He was God's son. He was following God's plan. He was free to function as God was with him. And when we accept what Jesus did on the cross— We are now made free. We have everything that we need to combat those charges and those lies and those things that still are stuck in that little tape recorder in our head, okay? Because we have God's word. And Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you have ever deboned an animal for cooking, like a chicken or a bird or scaled a fish, right? You know that there are ways to do it where you save the most meat and ways to do it where you leave a lot of remnants left over. And the God's word, it is able to cut out all of those things that are not a part of what God's plan is for us, for our lives, for the voice in our head that's speaking to us. And that's why we find scriptures in our communities. And that's why we emphasize what is a promise of God in the Bible that you can hold on to that will help you in the situation that you're facing or combating that thing in your head that keeps saying over and over again, you're not enough, you're not good enough, right? That's the difference between, as it says there in Hebrews 4.12, to be able to divide between soul, what's going on in your head, and spirit, what God tells you. Yeah, It can figure out which is which. Yep, and then you can begin to decipher and focus on the things that a God is telling you, right? And we have to read, that means we have to read it every day. I know it seems like, oh, what, you know, big deal if I don't read today or yesterday, whatever. Even if it's just one verse, stay in a book, read that one verse, open the Bible app, read the verse of the day, read something every day from God's word. As you do that, you ask him, all right, God, what is in this part for me today? What do you want me to know? And he will begin to highlight those things. It's almost, I don't even know how to describe it because everybody sees it differently. But like for me, sometimes it'll be like, almost like there's like a highlighter part on it. Like it's just like this, those words right there. Those words are mine for today, for this week, for this situation. And I'm going to take those words and I'm going to stand with Jesus on those. I'm going to pray over them with my, with my words. I'm going to focus on them. I'm going to write them down. I'm going to make sure 
that what he wants me to know, that is my focus and not all the other random stuff going on around me, right? And example could be John 3, 16, right? Everybody knows that verse. We've talked about it a lot. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We just, blah, 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 you know, wrote, jib it off. But when you think about that word, for God so loved the world, are you part of the world? Yes, we're all part of the world. We were all created by him, for him. We know that scripture says that. So if God so loved the world, then that means that God so loved you. So because God loved you, he sent his son. And then you make it personal. So God so loved me, so he sent his son for me. And if I believe in the son, right? And you just keep going on that. That is how you take God's word and you hold on to it and say, this is me. I am loved. I am not all those garbage things that other people said about me. I am not discarded. I am not trash. I am loved. Because God so loved the world, and I'm part of the world. God loves me. I'm valued. I'm important. And that begins to combat those thoughts. Again, John 8, 36, who the sun sets free is free. So if we are free, if we've accepted Jesus, right? I've, if I've accepted God's sacrifice for me and I gave him my life and I'm now free, I don't have to be stuck in the mindset, the situation. God will show me how to do the practical things I need to do to be set free. You might need to talk to someone for additional wisdom, counseling. You might just need to pray and pray in the spirit. We're going to talk more about that in a bit. We, you might just need to write that scripture, memorize it. Every time those thoughts come in, the first thing you do is say, no, God's word says. And that's an out loud thing. That's because when we hear it, it changes things. This, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? We have faith that God's words are true. We speak them. We hear them. We receive them. It begins to sink deeper and deeper and becomes what our new playlist is, right? We may have to change our routines to avoid those things that trigger those thoughts. We may have to set new patterns in our life, right? If you're with somebody who's still speaking that stuff over you and you know it's not what Jesus says about you, you know it's not God, you might need to have a hard conversation. You might need to leave that situation. You might need to get help to get out of that situation. Ask God, what do I need to do here? He will show you. Okay. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. We, lots of people struggling with anxiety in our world today. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So break it down. All right, so we can bring our worries and our thoughts to Jesus, right? We can give them to him through prayer and thank him that he has it covered. And then it promises that the peace of God will come and it will set up a guard of our hearts and our minds through Christ. Because peace is the opposite of anxiety, yeah. of anxiousness. Yep, so when those anxious thoughts start to, to spin in your head, Pray out in the spirit. Pray out to Jesus. Say, okay, God, here it is. It's coming. I feel it. Because most people, they can say, oh, here it comes, right? And you, you don't. keep your guard up, though. You got to keep your thing. guard up, right? And then you go, okay, pray in the spirit. That's your number one weapon of defense. If you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit where you pray in that special language that speaks God's perfect will for the situation, please talk to your community people about it or message us so we can talk to you. It is the number one tool to fight this. Pray out in the spirit. Ask God. Go back to this verse. Okay, God, I'm going to give you these things that are causing anxiety right now. These are the roots. These are the triggers. These are the things. I thank you that you are with me. I thank you that you're helping me walk through this. And because of that, I have your peace. And you begin to pray that, confess that, speak that again out loud if you're in a place that you can't. And that's where you're going to find the freedom. And it, you may need to call a friend for prayer, right? That's a great resource. It's kind of like on that was that show where you get the, do you use your lifeline, right? Lifeline. Lifeline. Ages. Call a friend, right? 
you have that option. That's why we're in community. That's why we're part of the body of Christ and we're not just individuals floating out there on our own. We need each other. That's you, why discipleship always happens in community. Exactly. We grow and learn to be more like Jesus because we're with one another, talking, loving, praying, sharing life together. And, you know, you might have, like I said, you may have to schedule some counseling. Yes, Jesus. Okay, what do I need to do to get through this? You might need to learn some skills. Get some skills. But know that his word is true. His promise is true. If you give everything to him with thanksgiving, thanking him for what he's doing, his peace will come and will guard you. And, you know, if a situation comes up, like say you're in a work review and it's not the greatest. There's, there's some things you need to work on, right? And it triggers all this stuff about the worthlessness of who you are and inability. Take a deep breath. Take a moment. Pray in the spirit. <coughs> hey, Jesus, help me learn what I need to know from this. I need you. Help me process this. Help me understand how to be a better employee, right? He is there. He wants to be there with you. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, God's word promises that we can have our minds change. We don't have to be stuck. We can figure out what God's will is, what is good and acceptable and perfect, right? All those negative thoughts, they are not good, acceptable, and perfect. Therefore, they do not exist in God's kingdom. They do not have power over us unless we let them. We can make, if we can make new physical habits, if we can change how we eat and how we move our bodies and all the things that we do in the natural world to stay healthy and fit, or what, we can do that with our minds. God's promised that, and he's going to be there. Sometimes it might be working on one thought at a time or a category of thoughts, right? And you find, again, find God's promises. Find the scriptures. Let them be the truth that you live by, live with, in, but just get it in you. Let it be bigger than that stuff, and let God be God. And it does take choosing Jesus' truth and not those thoughts and those lies. What is really true? God's word. Okay? We have to rewrite that inner tape, inner MP3 list, inner playlist. The playlist. The playlist of our mind has to be rewritten. Learning to see what Jesus says about us and what he's called us. He calls us his kids. He calls us loved. He calls us empowered to tell people about him, to walk in freedom, to have peace and love and joy and all the fruits of the Spirit active and at work in our lives. And if we look at Paul. He writes this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 7. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, so in our physical world, we're not waging war according to the flesh. This is not a battle we fight with swords and guns and all the you know, physical weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. So prayer, 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 prayer. Our weapons are not physical things. They are God's power, God's word, praying, fighting against that stuff that has controlled our minds for however long you've allowed it to control your mind. Because once you accept Jesus, it's a process of allowing Jesus to take over and transform that. And get the help you need. If you need to learn skills, like I said, go get skills. But remind yourself, you are Christ. So that last line, remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. We are all belong to him. And he's got good stuff for us. He wants to reveal the truth. And we can and will see the power that the thoughts and changes will all that stuff will diminish, and we will be able to fulfill what God has for us. So question, how has God helped you 
in the past, rewrite those old thoughts and mindsets. Because if you've come to Jesus and you've really given him your life, you've been through a transformation process. Some stuff has been reworked. Some stuff has already been reworked. From the day you say yes to Jesus, he's at work transforming you. If you're continuing to submit, he's making you new. So what? think about your life. What things did you used to be like or used to believe or used to have? And how are you free from that now? Share your testimony, your story of what God's done, right? And then, once again, if you're still facing something that's very specific to you, choose a scripture for something that you want to overcome now. Look it up on your Bible app. Do a search. Find something that you can say, okay, this is what I'm going to hold on to. He did it then. Share your story. And he's going to do it now. So we are free. You say that together in a community. We are free. 
people say that in the community, right? Yes. Say with me? Yeah. It would have been weird to okay. say it now. Because it's true. We are free. Right? If you have given Jesus your life, you are free. Period. Done. Okay? The charges have been dropped. Jesus already took our punishment. There's nothing left for us to be punished for. Right? The lies in our head are lies. Okay? A lie is not real. A lie is made up. Okay? They have no power unless we give them power. Unless we choose to, well, that's just who I am and just going to be that. Because that's not what Jesus says. The accuser of the brother, Satan, has been defeated. He has no more power. His accusations mean nothing. He's just standing in the corner speaking to nothing because it does has no power, again, unless we allow it to. We take up our sword of truth. That's what the Bible calls the word of God in the armor of God section in Ephesians. You can read about that. The word of God, it gives us freedom. It divides and cuts off all that other stuff. That might be a little bit of a painful process of healing back because it's surgery sometimes. It's deep inside us. We're like, how did I get these things? Where did they come from? Realizing why they're there and getting the truth you need to rewrite them, right? We can get prayer and we have counseling and learn skills to how to deal with what all that stuff's going on in our heads. And as we focus on the truth, as we focus on who God is, who he's called us to be, and what he said about us, we will find freedom. We will have the natural freedom to walk it out. We'll begin to walk out of that jail of lies into the freedom that God planned for us before sin came into the world. And we can believe who we are in Christ and not the lies. And then we have the confidence to go out into the world and say, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. I have something valuable to share and to give. God gave me things that you need, and I have things, you have things that I need, and we can partner together. We can build positive relationships, and we can see God do big things, right? We are free because he first loved us. John 13, 34 through 35 says this. Jesus is talking. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. We can't love well when we're believing the lies in our heads. We can't serve well when we don't think we're good enough. We hide ourselves. We keep ourselves back. We aren't open and free because of all the things that roll around in the Rolodex or the little filter, the video clip, the projector screen, whatever you want to call it, that says we're unqualified, we don't have enough, our life's too much of a mess, so we can't be real. But Jesus says, who the sun sets free is free. And you are free to love and care and be loved and be cared for because he is with you, he is for you, and you do not have to live in that jail of lies anymore. Right? Jesus, for freedom's sake, you set us free. You came to redeem and restore that which was damaged and broken by sin, either our sin or by other people's sin, by speaking things into our lives that were not true. That they spoke things that you did not say. Father, you set us free. So, Father, we believe you. We reject the voice of the enemy. We say, be silent in the authority of Jesus. We ask, Holy Spirit, you continue to renew, as it says in Romans, and transform our thoughts and our minds, and we bring them into obedience to Christ. We take them captive into obedience to of Christ, what you say. Father, continue to help that transformation and help us to see your promises and your thoughts in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.